I didn't want to be accused of gaming data. I didn't want to be accused of putting my finger on the scale, which is exactly what I feel the city's doing to try to justify their bike lanes. They're paying $50 for bicycle couriers to come and speak at their public consultation, $50 for 30 people to show up at their consultation. What? Wow. If we're not anti-cycling. Unfortunately, there's an awful lot of back scratching going on back and forth between the transportation department, between Cycle TO and members of the public who have companies who are benefiting. The reason so many cyclists are against these bike lanes that I've heard is that they don't think they're safe. All right, welcome to the Toronto Real Estate Podcast. My name is Corey Marin, broker and co-founder at Fox Marin. Today, we're discussing the intricacies of bike lane development in Toronto, the good, the bad, and the ugly. It's one of the most controversial topics in the city right now, and everyone seems to have an opinion. Why do we need bike lanes? How are they impacting the city and downtown neighborhoods? And how will this impact the future of Toronto from traffic congestion and flow, lack of parking for local businesses, and emergency vehicle access? Join us as we navigate through the strategies, the challenges, and successes of Toronto's bike lane initiatives and ponder the future of urban cycling in this very city. Stay tuned as we pedal through these insights and more on today's episode. Be sure to like, subscribe, and turn on notifications for more content related to this topic and much, much more. Okay, so I am pleased to introduce none other than Trevor Townsend, founder of Keep Toronto Moving. This volunteer-based not-for-profit organization comprised of engaged citizens, advocates for harmonious coexistence among bike lanes, vehicles, and pedestrians in Toronto. Operating without employees or business ties, Keep Toronto Moving champions common sense, data-driven decision-making, and most importantly, transparency. They aim to encourage Toronto's decision makers to collect and interpret road use data fairly and openly, rationally and sensibly, and implement their findings. They envision a city where bike lanes are shaped by comprehensive impartial data analyzed year round. Keep Toronto Moving is committed to periodically reviewing the effectiveness of arterial bike lanes and assessing their impact on traffic, local business, and usage. They strive for a bike lane decision-making process untainted by political agendas, lobbyists, skewed data, or biased bureaucratic influences. I will be your official host today. My name is Ralph Fox, and I am the broker of record and co-founder of Fox Marin. Wow, that was a lot to say. What a pleasure it is to have you here joining us, Trevor. Uh, Corey and I can honestly say we've been very much looking forward to having this discussion. It's something that is coming up more and more in conversations uh, literally on a daily basis, uh, not just with clients or real estate related, but it just seems to be a topic everywhere. And we thought, who better to have you on the show to talk a little bit about the topic and and give us a little, start off maybe by giving us a little bit of background of yourself and how you got involved with Keep Toronto Moving. All right. Thank you, Corey. Thank you, Ralph. So a little bit of background. I uh, have never been involved in anything municipally in politics. I was away last year and uh, in, sorry, earlier this year in January, and I had an email come across my iPhone that indicated that my neighborhood association was endorsing the Young Street bike lanes. At the time, they were a uh, proposal by the city, but they were permanent. And so I got back to Toronto and decided enough. Uh, I don't know anybody who thinks that these bike lanes on the major arterial roads in the city. And when I say arterial, I mean Young Street, the Danforth, Bloor Street West, Proposed bike lanes are going to be along Eglinton. Uh, Shepherd Avenue's coming up. Avenue Road they're working on. And there's a plethora of other major arterial roads in the city that they're looking to introduce these bike lanes. And so I decided, like, someone's got to do something. And I went on the internet and I looked. Nowhere was there anybody, organization, that was in an organized way refuting. A lot of what I saw were misleading statistics, misleading data that the city was using to try to justify putting these bike lanes onto their major roads, our major roads. And so I decided before I got moving uh, and I came up with a name, Keep Toronto Moving, 
And I thought it was a good name because it very much reflects the problem that all of us are experiencing on major two roads. And that is that we're no longer able to move efficiently around the city. And that's not good for, that's not good for anybody. Good for businesses, not good for the population as a whole getting around and about in the city. And so we, I set up Keep Toronto Moving website, just a little plug. KeepTorontoMoving.ca is our website. I encourage people to go and take a look at it. And from there, we started to actively lobby to the municipal council members to that we should be looking to review these bike lanes. Then John Tory announced that he was stepping aside. And I thought this is a perfect opportunity to step up and influence and get a lot of attention on municipal politics during the by-election, mayoral by-election. This is a great opportunity to get out there and highlight and elevate some of the issues that I see in the city with these bike lanes. First thing I did was I went, I did a poll. I hired a friend of mine who had a polling company, professional third-party poll. Questions were professionally formulated by, by individuals who do this for a living because I didn't want to be accused of gaming data. I didn't want to be accused of putting my finger on the scale, which is exactly what I feel the city's doing to try to justify their bike lanes. I wanted to be above reproach in ensuring that the methodology that I used was fair and transparent and credible, uh, which is exactly what I thought the city of Toronto couldn't say with what they were doing. And so we went out, we did the poll. Navigator has a division that does public opinion polling. And the results were very interesting. They were very encouraging because what the results said to us was that a lot of what I felt, most people felt across the city. And so we launched our website, keeptronomoving.ca. They say I should say something five or six times <laughs> and then people remember. <laughs> keeptronomoving.ca, we launched it. And our lead story when we launched the website was that we've done a poll and look at these bike lanes are not a consensus driven policy at the initiative. And one of the most alarming things that I saw was that not only were people not supportive of bike lanes on arterial roadways, but third of cyclists, individuals who themselves identify that they cycle on a regular basis on Toronto roads, they weren't in favor of these bike lanes on arterial roadways. Not my information. Go to my website, our website, take a look. You'll see the poll reference what, there. What's your website? <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, keep, so go to teachjohnmoving.ca and you'll see on that website uh, that uh, you can reference the poll that was done that, in fact, cycle the cycling interests at Transport Toronto do not represent and Cycle TO, which is the main organization that works with the City Transportation Department to introduce these bike lanes, they do not represent what everyday taxpaying residents in the city feel. So it's quite encouraged by that. John Tory t- exits left stage and we go at it uh, and we start to lobby through our not-for-profit, uh, the mayoral candidates. And very quickly, you saw candidates come out recognizing that it was an issue that the, that the general public weren't in favor of. You had Anthony Fury, probably most prominently, came out against many of the arterial bike lanes in the city. And then you had Mark Saunders come out and oppose several of the bike lanes in the city on the arterial roads. So it became very, very clear to me that if you watched Anthony Fury's support, he started around 2 or 3%. He ended at 13% until uh, John Tory endorsed Anna Bailao. And then all the anybody but Olivia Chow movement came to life and all candidates saw the air come out of their tires. Everybody's trying to stop Olivia Chow, <laughs> who didn't who didn't support what she stood for. So, so that's the one thing I wanted to mention. The other thing I want to mention to you is that if you take a look at the data that the city is using to justify these bike lanes, it's very skewed. Young Street, for example. I went and they, Young Street had studies done at the beginning of introducing the bike lanes and towards the end. And they reported that 12% of A activity, commuting activity going north-south on Young Street between Bloor and Davisville, 12%, and this was in September, October of 2022, they reported that 12% of all activity were cyclists. And I thought to myself, how can anybody suggest for, for a nanosecond that one in 12 people, uh, cars or bikes or, or, or cycles going up and down Young Street? I looked closely at their data, and what I learned was that they don't collect data from November 1st to the end of April. Okay, that's, so that's convenient. 
that's convenient. There's no cycling in the winter, they said, so we can't collect data. All right, well, the rest of us are using the streets in the winter and, and the uh, pavement, the, if you will, the real estate that they've, that they've taken away from commuters for cycling is not put back in the winter months. But it gets better than that. They don't collect data on days when it's precipitation. So if it's raining between May and the end of <laughs> October, they won't collect data on those dates either. Because cyclists can't be expected to be out commuting on wet days. So that, so that data was taken <laughs> off. Gets even better though. They don't collect data on days where it's seasonally above or seasonally below what the temperature should be for that time of year. So in July and August, if we have a heat wave, we're not going to measure bike lane activity on those days. If in October or in, in May, if it's a little cooler than that's typical, we're not going to measure bike activity on those days either. So it turned out that over the six months of the year, that they collected data, they collected data three days of for each of those six months. And one of those days had to be a Saturday or Sunday. So of course, most of the commuting activity occurs Monday to Friday. And so one third of the data they collected was on a Saturday or a Sunday. And then the other two thirds were Monday to Friday. But those Monday to Friday days when they were collecting activity, it was like going on a holiday to San Diego. Okay, because that was the weather conditions that they were utilizing to justify bike lane usage. And so, look, it, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to understand what's going on here. They gain data, they gathered statistics that are played to the story uh, that they want uh, to tell, tell to the city. And I've seen this since then over and over and over again. And so, you know, we've got to step back and we've got to be reasonable here. Keep Toronto mm -hmm. moving is not anti bike lane. In fact, surprisingly, so even to me, as a founder of the organization, I'm going to say better than half of the people who are actively involved. These are people who are involved in writing the copy for the website, people who are involved in going out and organizing. Better than half of the people involved in this organization are active cyclists, like really active cyclists, not just that they have a bicycle and they go out three or four times a year cycling. These are people who cycle all the time. They themselves are not in favor of cycle lanes. And so that kind of took me back to the poll we did at the beginning, which showed that a third of cyclists don't support these bike lane initiatives. Long-winded answer, I hope I answered it. What you're saying sounds somewhat almost conspiratorial. Like, is there a conspiracy? It seems like what you're describing is there's a group or groups who are manipulating data to an end. So what is actually, I understand what you're saying, but tell me what is actually happening. I won't use the word conspiratorial, mainly because, look, I think people who are cyclists in Toronto who want to build out safe cycle paths to travel on have best interests at in making a safe streets for cycling, but they're not doing it the right, the right way. The head of transportation was brought in from Seattle. Her name's Barbara Gray. You can type in Barbara Gray, Seattle uh, bike lanes, and you will see that all of the terminology that the city of Toronto is using right now is the same terminology they used in 2016, 17, when she worked in Seattle. They brought somebody in who had introduced extensive bike lane network, and that's what she's done. She was hot. She was brought in for that purpose. I'm told by people that members of the transportation department who didn't agree with how she was doing this were packaged off and let go early on in the process. I don't know who they are. And so that's, but I'm told by people that if you weren't drinking the Kool-Aid, you were no longer welcome at the party. There's an understanding, I think, at City Hall. And, and unfortunately, we have a weak council. We have council members that don't represent their constituents. And we also have council members who are afraid that if they do represent their constituents, that they will be taking on the bike lobby and that they, it will be to their re-election peril. And so, sadly, without any organized opposition to these bike lanes, there's been no opportunity for a counterbalance argument. And so, at keeptronomoving.ca, we are not against bike lanes. I want to make that categorically clear to everybody. We're not against bike lanes. I think bike lanes are a good thing, and I encourage bike lanes. I encourage, but you got to put them in safe places. You got to put them... It doesn't make sense to put bike lanes on the busiest, most congested streets in our city. If you look at this data, I'm going to take you to the holy grail of data collection in Canada. Okay. It's called the Canadian Census. 
massive budget, massive resources, you know, gold standard in collecting data. Okay. And we do a massive data collection through the Canada census once every 10 years. And then they do one that's not so comprehensive every five years. If you go back and look at the census from 2011, it was around 2% of people who identified that they use cycles, bicycles to cycle to work, to commute to work. It was about 2%. The other 98% were using public transit, whether it be buses, subways, or walking, were using cars. 2% represented commuters to get to work. So that was in 2011. Again, what now they did a smaller uh, sample size in 2015, but again in 2016, rather, in Toronto, it remained around 2%, give or take a quarter, half a percent. And then in 2021, they did another census. And again, it was, a, it was actually went a, got a little less. It, re, it was reduced, uh, came down. Now, I'm going to give them a pass on that. I'm going to s- assume that maybe some of the after effects of COVID, maybe more people were staying at home. But the story and the point I'm trying to make to you is that since 2011, for all the money, for all the resources, for all the time, for all the putting your finger on the scale to try and make it look like the cycling is, is building, statistically, Census Canada's information, which no one can accuse anybody of manipulating, it's a professional uh, o- operation, it shows that there's been no growth in cycling uh, on our Toronto streets. So this argument that build out the infrastructure and they shall come just isn't happening, okay? And we're spending hundreds of millions of dollars here on building out infrastructure, putting up concrete, uh, uh, you know, walls in our streets. And that's money that could be better spent on dealing with mental health, dealing with crime on our public transportation system. That's money that can be better spent building, repairing potholes. Look, I think the population of Toronto know deep down what's good for their own city. And I don't believe people are buying what's going on here. And so I'm going to suggest to you that it's just a matter of time because these people, Cycle TO, who get, by the way, Cycle TO, which, which doesn't necessarily represent at least a third of their members from what I've seen from the, from the public opinion polling that we've done and people involved in my organization, Cycle TO is out there. They get grants from the city of Toronto, big grants to hire set people to work, to promote back to the city of Toronto, bicycle uh, infrastructure. They got third money. Uh, they got money from Trillium, Ontario. It was $80,000, $90,000 from Trillium, Ontario to, to hire staff to raise money for them. It's a charity. So every dollar that someone donates to Cycle TO, the taxpayers end up giving, a, they get a charitable receipt and that gets deducted off of taxes owing. So the reality here is that Cycle TO, which is in very closely aligned, t- there are people within the Cycle TO uh, uh, operation at work in transport at the city of Toronto. So there's a, there's, there's a sim- symbiotic relationship there. Guys, it's, it's all smells really bad. From the standpoint of being a professional operation with the Transport Toronto, yeah, from what I'm seeing, it's not operating the way I always thought government operated, where they did things objectively and fairly and in the public's best interest. It's been hijacked by people who have an agenda. And that agenda is a dangerous one because it's, it's going to have dire consequences on our city's ability to, to carry on in a way that people will want to live here. Mm-hmm. Like, honestly, you look at the downtown quarter, which was decimated by COVID. Decimated. Well, who wants to come downtown if it's going to take you three times as long because they've got all the roadways now down? And what happens to the businesses downtown? And what happens in our path system? All those uh, small business owners that have mortgaged their houses to set up businesses and run out businesses, with their, if there aren't people working in our office towers, how do they pay their bills? How do they pay staff? How do they hire people? So the impact that bike lanes is having in making Toronto a core, downtown core, a less desirable place uh, to want to work and come down to is going to have long-term repercussions. And I, I really worry because we have a pretty good thing here in Toronto, and it took a long time to get to where we're at right now. But we've got a group at City Hall, and I, and I say councillors as well, certainly the mayor, and to, to be fair to Olivia Chow, she didn't run on a mandate of not supporting bike lanes. She ran on that mandate. She got elected. She has a mandate. 
Whether or not she'll get reelected is uh, hopefully a different story altogether. But that's for October 26, <laughs> 2026. So, you know, the, the clock is on. Uh, less than three years from now, we'll be back at it again. And Toronto, Keep Toronto Moving is all about making sure that the public understand that if they're not happy with bike lanes, there's a place you can go, whether or not you live in Etobicoke, whether or not you live up to Danforth, whether or not you live in North York, whether or not you live in the downtown core, there's a place you can go where you can express your concerns and grievances with the city. And we've got enormous momentum, guys. Enormous momentum. I cannot believe the number of people out there that are coming forward and want to get involved. And so, you know, I, I'm quite optimistic uh, that when we get into the 2026 election cycle, that uh, people are finally going to have a voice and they're, they're going to send a message loud and clear that you're on the wrong path. I can just say from personal experience, and I am not pro or con either way, uh, if I felt safe using a bike lane, I perhaps might use it. I don't really feel encouraged to do it. As you said, build and they shall come. I have no desire to jump on one of those in any way. We personally live just off of Bloor Street West. It's been a disaster. It's a disaster to drive on. It's a disaster to walk on. It's a d disaster to park anywhere to access small business. Now they just cut up the whole thing again. I don't even know what's going on. You only have like a measly section of Bloor Street to walk through when you uh, cross St. George heading eastbound. And I don't even want to drive anymore because it takes a so long to get from one place to another. I don't want to go out on the east side of the city or downtown because it takes forever. There is absolutely nowhere to park. And as a driver, which I would say I'm more consistent as a driver than a cyclist, I'm scared of hitting a bike. <laughs> like, I actually feel like it's just such a disaster in terms of the rules of the road, e-bikes, pedestrians, construction, that I feel like there's a high probability that I might end up in sort of a confrontation. So I just am choosing to walk to avoid all of it when possible. That's how crazy it is. Well, there's a counselor out in Etobicoke, Corey. His name is Gord Perks. There's another one out there. Her name's Amber Morley. They have had community groups on calls with these counselors. They've just introduced these bike lanes now out in, um, on Bloor West. People are going nuts out there. It's crazy. Overnight, by putting in these bike lanes, they have brought Bloor Street to a halt. And people are livid about it. And Gordon Perks was talking to uh, somebody who um, wanted to speak with him directly about it. And you know what he said in a call to uh, this gentleman? He said, congestion's not necessarily a bad thing. And so to come back to Ralph's comment earlier, I don't want to talk about conspiracy theories because I don't want to sound like, you know, there's some like, who, you know, force going on out there. But when a counselor elected by the taxpayers actually says... Con con congestion is not a bad thing because it forces people to use public transit. I'm sorry. Like, honestly, where was that in your election brochure when you were running? You know? So, so at the end of the day, it's not about getting rid of bike lanes. It's about putting them in, in the right places. And putting them in the right places means that you don't pick the busiest, most congested, dangerous streets in the, street, in the city to carve, up, carve away uh, space for for bicycling. Nothing wrong with cycling in the cities, but it shouldn't be on those main arterial roads. And that's what Keep Toronto Moving is about. And we will continue to support cyclists and, and the good merits of cycling, what it offers. And there are places, there are good streets for cycling, uh, cycles, bicycle infrastructure we built, but not on those major streets. And that's what we're about here. And so, um, so I think it's about everybody adding a little water to their wine and everybody being reasonable. And, and unfortunately, as it stands right now, city council, I think there's out of the 25 councillors that are representing the good people of Toronto, I'm going to say 19 or 20 of them vote always in favor of bike lanes. Every vote, they voted in favor of bike lanes. And so under the strong mayor powers that uh, were brought in by the provincial government, if the mayor of the city can get one third of council, so nine council members on any item relating to transportation or housing that's proposed by the mayor, that's enough to control a council decisions in that regard. So we need to get, realistically, another five or six councillors elected of the 25. Then we'll be at 10 or 11. 
I actually think we're going to do a lot more than that. And we need to get a mayor elected who understands the bigger picture here. And that is that we are destroying our downtown and our, and our major arterial roads and, and, and commuting in the city. And so it's just a matter of time. I would maintain to you that on October the 26th of 2026, when we have our next election, there's nobody out there who's annoyed about bike lanes that are going to be any less annoyed because they're not being used. It's 2% of the population. I was talking to somebody recently who did a master's in bike lane infrastructure at Metropolitan University, uh, formerly Ryerson. And oh, good job. I thought, <laughs> oh, wow. I thought this guy's going to give me an earful. I was blown away. He said, no. He said, they're stupid. They shouldn't be there. He did a master's in it himself. He said, stupid, they shouldn't be there. He said, another thing he said, you should be aware of. A lot of the statistics that they're using about these bike lanes aren't net new. So they're saying, oh, we've got more people using them now than we did a year ago. Well, he said, there aren't more cyclists actually on the roadways. It's just that somebody who used to take a side road maybe to go where they were going now go on the bike lanes. So there's not net new people cycling that weren't cycling before. They're just now being channeled onto the arterial roadways in the city like everybody else is there already. <laughs> uh, and so it is actually, it's, it's again, another gaming of data. And this is the problem is that these guys are pros. I'm a financial advisor at Can Accord Genuity. I have no interest in running for mayor or for council. I will never be seeking public office for anything. So I have no interest. I'm volunteering my time to do this because I'm disgusted that people who are elected and do collect salaries are doing such a horrific job of representing the best interests of our city. So, but we need to get out there and we need to find people who agree. And it's not going to be hard to find those people not only agree with us, but are also prepared to put their names on the ballot and run in the next municipal election. And so under strong mayor powers, we get 11, 10 or 11 councillors in with the mayor and you watch just as sure as God made green small apples, those bike lanes will be taken out as fast as you can count them being having gone in. And so it's just a matter of time. And these people who are pushing this agenda have no capacity to be reasonable and to find a fair middle ground. They've got control of the levers. They control 20 to 25 seats. They've got a budget of over $200 million to roll these bike lanes out. And they have their foot in the gas and they, nothing is going to stop them except themselves. They are going to upset so many people across this city as they have from what I've seen already. But they're, they're still, by the way, we're not even halfway through the bike infrastructure plan. Go on to Cycle TO, uh, sorry, go on, to, yeah, go on to the Cycle TO website, go to City of Toronto, look at the mapping that's ahead of us. Folks, this is just getting going here. There's still more to come. It's crazy. I live between Avenue Road and Young Street on a through street, which is now, by the way, a parking lot in the morning and nighttime because cars are trying to escape these, these massive traffic jams. So they're now racing back and forth on side streets, residential side streets with children and elderly people. And, you know, and so these politicians don't realize you, and, and Cycle T.O. doesn't realize if you don't compromise, if you are not reasonable, then you will be removed. And that I maintain to you is what we're going to see. The clock's counting less than three years. I'm very optimistic about it. So something you said earlier, um, and by the way, I appreciate your passion on the topic. It just emanates and oozes. So that's awesome to see. It's rare to see somebody so passionate about something that they're not even being compensated for. They're just doing it because they believe in it. It really stuck to me where you sort of talked about having weak leadership and weak counselors at, uh, at City Hall. But one of the things, and it was probably even the intonation around it, when you talked about the bicycle lobby and it was almost in a tone where in the U.S. they talk about like the NRA or something like that and having their grip on, on, on seeing legislative change. Can you tell me a little bit more about the bike lobby and why it seems, at least in this current climate, that counselors are, are just bending a knee without seemingly even asking questions based on what you're saying? Diane Sachs, who was just recently elected in my area, 
uh, barely elected, uh, <laughs> Diane Sachs, when we were dealing with Young Street bike lanes back in March, whether or not to, it was going to the Infrastructure Environment Committee, and Diane Sachs was a sitting council member at that point on that committee. And Cycle TO posted on their Instagram a thank you to Diane Sachs because they had asked Diane Sachs to come and speak to their members who were going to be coming to lobby the Infrastructure and Environment Committee that she's a sitting member on. So this elected official from the city of Toronto was running training programs for Cycle TO at City Hall. At City Hall, she was representing, she was rep running programs to help their members who were going to be coming and speaking at the committee. So she was there lobbying, teaching them how to lobby back to the committee. Hmm. And so that to me is just like, talk about having no sense of fairness that you're supposed to be a public official representing everybody. And she's actually working uh, for them. That's the first point I want to make about, mm -hmm. and I've seen this over and over again with other counselors. They're in cahoots with the lobby group and with Transport Toronto's senior leadership to bring these bike lanes up. Another thing, like we're talking a couple hundred million dollars is what they're looking at putting into these bike lanes. Question for you, who's building it all out? They've got contracts out there with companies that are making millions and millions and millions of dollars through public tender. And so I got a call back in the spring from somebody at our phone number, which you, you can find on our website. And this guy was going on ferociously about how we were, you know, how horrible we were and blah, 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 blah. Anyway, I looked him up on LinkedIn after that call. She worked for a company on DuPont Street that is basically building out the the bike uh, storage racks that are, he all, didn't say worked, he owned the company that was doing the fa fabricating bicycle uh, storage racks, the creative ones. You know, sometimes they're in the shape of a dog or they do, you know, they're sort of, they're nice looking. To his credit, he does good work. But unfortunately, this guy is making a living off the infrastructure budgets of the taxpayer. And he set up all these bogus groups. And so I've seen time and time again where a lot of these people out there, especially on social media, I'm 55 years old. I'm not a social media guy. They are. These are all people out there. And there's about, I'm going to tell you something. There's about probably 15 or 20 of them. And all they do is troll Twitter and Instagram. And, and, and you see the same names over and over and over again. By the way, they never put their own name out there. I'm Trevor Townsend. I'm on my website. You can throw an egg at my house, which I've had done by people. Uh, really? Uh, yes. I think that was a, a radical one, one. I don't think that represents a lot of these people, to be fair, but there's some radical people out there Interesting. Uh, in, in their movements. Uh, I can say I've never tracked down their addresses and thrown an egg at their house. But, you know, there's a, that, but that's not, the point is that <laughs> I want to be a reasonable, reasonable, fair sound voice here. And that's what our organization represents. We're not anti-cycling. And I think that, unfortunately, there's an awful lot of back scratching going on back and forth between the transportation department, between Cycle TO, and members of the public who have companies who are benefiting from the hundreds of millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars every year being spent in building out the infrastructure. Who's paying for all of this? The city of Toronto isn't putting it up. It's being subcontracted out to. But all these companies that are winning lucrative contracts are giving money back. And, and so it's, it's not fair what's happening. And this is the only way it's been able to happen is because I think that essentially uh, Transport Toronto, Transportation Toronto that's rolling these out have been hijacked and they're not representing the general public's viewpoint on it. And so it's sad because when it's all said and done in three years from now, we will have spent $150 million plus dollars building out infrastructure that could have gone to a second Cam H in downtown Toronto. It pains me when I walk to the parking lot where I have my car that it pains me to see a homeless person addicted to street drugs living in a bus shelter when that money that we're spending on bike lanes should be spent on helping people like that. It should be spent on infrastructure for policing to protect people who are going on our subway system so that they get a number of people I talk to who are afraid to have their kids travel on the subways and on public transit for fear something's going to happen. I have countless stories of people who've encountered our public transit system 
uh, which, by the way, is shouldn't be called the TTC. It should be called the TT free because they no longer police collecting fares. They, they, you can walk in and out of them. I see people doing it all the time when I'm traveling on the subway. They have the little thing open so that they don't even track fares. They're not allowed to track fares being collected anymore. So we have a public transit system that's now become a, a, a warm place for homeless people to sit on all day long. And it's a poor use of tax dollars that could be so much better spent on things that have so much more meaningful impact to make this the best city possible. Another thing we haven't touched on, guys, mm -hmm. and that is the infrastructure for ambulances and fire trucks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Like, there's I'm a, sorry. There's a, there's a video you have I saw on your website where it's showing uh, a fire truck unable to get through because of all the congestion on Young Street and like, everything is just shut down and like one bike goes by on the five minutes that everything was shut down. Yeah. I mean, that's Young Street. It's the TTC. So when the TTC goes down and we have to start running buses to get people from downtown back and forth up to North York and through you know, the rest of the city, we are now, all of those buses, all of those cars are sharing one northbound and one southbound lane from Davisville up to, um, so Davisville, excuse me, down to Bloor. And so look at like, that I, I had a lady call me up, burst into tears. She said, my son has a peanut allergy. Okay. I live on a street in Summer Hill called Walker Avenue. Uh, she said, if my son were to have a, an allergic reaction and if his throat were to close in and it happens during rush hour, like it's a life or death consequence. Okay. And so uh, she's like, my husband and I are actively considering selling. Who knows? Maybe they'll become a customer of yours if they haven't been already. But the point I'm making to you in a, in a lighthearted way on that comment, but the point I make to you guys is that, like, there are very real consequences to the fact that our, our, our EMS vehicles, our fire vehicles can't get out there. And the leadership in those departments are not allowed to speak publicly about the problems. On Young Street, I spoke with members of the fire department and the, the data they collected, they ran around saying, oh, well, it's only made transportation, uh, it's only slowed down your, your typical commute up and down Young Street by 70 seconds or 80 seconds. Well, what they didn't tell you is that they, the, 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 the geographic footprint that they used wasn't Young Street. They included in that geographic footprint, they broadened it out. They included on the east, uh, Mount Pleasant, and on the west, they included Avenue Road. So. By give, putting a much bigger denominator, by putting a much larger catchment area, then, of course, it reduces the delays. And by the way, if we really want to be fair here, we should really just be looking at the delays between 7 in the morning and, let's say, 7 at night. Because really, realistically, when there are people on the roads at 3 in the morning, that data shouldn't be part of your 70-second uh, speaking point on how it's not affecting traffic. And so... Again, another example of data manipulation, uh, but this is the consequences are much greater. There are eight or 9,000 people that are landlocked on Young Street between um, St. Clair down to, um, down to Rosedale Subway Station, seven or 8,000 people that have to come in and out of Young Street to get to the side streets that are dead ended. Yep. And so it's unfortunate because I, I just would have thought the city of Toronto was more professional. I would have thought that they, that we live in a democracy, that the data they use, that there would be some shame there to be fair and balanced in the way they were rolling out public policy. Sadly, I've come to the conclusion that there's a, that it's been hijacked by a group of people that are a bit too fanatical uh, uh, and it's going to take the public. And I challenge people, if you're upset about bike lanes, mark your calendars, put a reminder on your iPhone today, October 26th of 2026, you better get out there and vote. And you better get to keep trying to moving's website and look at what we're doing. And, and, and because look, at it's up to everybody to be engaged here. This, the, re, the way this all happened was that people were complacent. They didn't get out. They didn't, they didn't get involved. And now you have a reason that you need to get out and get involved. Apathy, eh, this is what happens when people are apathetic uh, at the municipal level. Have you been hearing from a lot of small business owners as well on these major bike lane routes? Absolutely. We uh, did, we again hired a company and they did up a questionnaire and we went to BIAs, uh, Business Improvement Associations. For people who don't know what they are, 
all of the shops and major arterial roads are across the city come together. They're, they're mandated with their tax dollars to put some money that goes into a little pot. And that helps to create opportunities for, for neighborhoods to be more attractive for seasonal promotions. And anyway, the BIAs, we went out and we went along the Danforth and we went along Young Street and we went along Blur Street West and we started interviewing business owners. We didn't go to churches. We didn't go to banks. We didn't go to chains like Tim Hortons or Subway or McDonald's or anything like that because they're corporately not allowed to participate. Okay. Uh, so, but what we did do, we didn't go to government agencies, uh, but what we did do is we went to small business owners. And so those are the people who work in their shops and are allowed to give their opinion. Those are people who have their own money on the line to run small businesses, bakeries, barber shops, hair salons, you know, small clothing shops. So we went to these merchants across the board and, and we interviewed them with uh, questionnaires of, with, with a list of professionally worded non-leading questions. And those results uh, we posted on our website as well. And across the board, there are people out there, to be fair, who like the bike lanes. Okay. So it's not like it's 100% of people out there are against bike lanes. I want to be transparent here. On Young Street, it was 90%. Better than 90% of people on Young Street, small business on Young Street, didn't think they were good for business. The one thing they did do, the city, they bribed restaurant owners by putting the cafe TO where they cut in part of the roadways. They then allowed for shops, for merch, for restaurants to put tables out. And they bribed those owners by giving them more real estate, if you will, for, during the pandemic. And then post-pandemic, they bribed them by keeping it going. I think last year, I don't know what the outcome was. They were, they were going to start charging money for that space. I don't know if that actually came to pass. But, but the city has used every conceivable lever available to them to try to influence and manipulate these bike lanes staying. And um, I don't know. Like, I, I just... I don't understand how we can work in a city, how we can live in a city where we have a government that has done what it's done and, and will continue to do. And so that's why I say to you guys, got to get people engaged in municipal politics. We look at cities, uh, you know, you look at cities in like Detroit, go to the West Coast and, uh, uh, you know, and, and the downtown cores of those cities have been decimated. And that's because businesses couldn't operate. And you don't have businesses and you don't have people downtown those businesses start to dry up. The downtown core starts to dry up, which is tax revenue. Then you're going to turn around and you start raising property taxes further to offset what we were making before uh, with a more broad tax base. I myself live between Young Street and Avenue Road. I used to go over to Avenue Road all the time. I now do anything to avoid <laughs> going over to Young Street. I will go up Avenue Road and around and come back down on a side street to get to a merchant, like my Rosedale Animal Hospital, where I have my dogs taken care of, I will go three times the distance to get to my vet, then go up Young Street, because I know it'll be less time. And the problem is that when people stop using those arterial roadways, then they stop thinking about them. And when you stop thinking about them, you no longer patronize them. And when you no longer patronize them, they no longer are in business. And then you've got, you know, you've got boarded up businesses. And it's not good for the city. It's not good for neighborhoods. So there are very real socioeconomic consequences that we are going to continue to see happen uh, on these arterial roads. You watch. It's, it's happening right now. And it's, um, it's just unfortunate. I don't think the public, I don't think people ever conceivably thought this could happen. But it's happening. And it's a bit of a nightmare. Why do you think that people are afraid to speak up about their opinion on this? So during the Young Street bike lane, uh, we, we had signs, keep Toronto moving signs that we went and we took out and we went to the merchants that were against them. We went to one shop owner who had a pet shop near Rosedale subway station. And she said, absolutely, I'd be happy to put a sign up. I don't know anyone who wants them. And then on her Instagram page, all these people started commenting that they were no longer going to patronize her shop and she's against safety for cyclists. And they started to attack her business. Um, and she, I went and talked to her. She said, you know, this one guy said he, he and his dog muffin or whatever, we're no longer <laughs> going to patronize my shop. She said, she said, I know my, I know my patrons. He's never been here before. 
So they got their professional PR team to go out and start attacking these businesses online. A restaurant owner in Summerhill, he put a sign in his lawn, in his window. They went on to his Yelp page and they started posting, oh, Terry service, serve me raw chicken. Uh, you know, food was undercooked. He didn't care. So, so I was talking to him. He said, yeah, he said, I went to their profiles and they were all active cyclists. Uh, he said, I've never had any of them top reviews. Uh, he said, and then this happened. We ran a rally at a, at a Firkin in Summerhill. And this poor guy who we paid him, we were a patron. We rented his restaurant for the night, beat him good money, brought the whole neighborhood together, had 150 people there. And this guy, when they found out, they went on to his Yelp or whenever the social media review is for restaurants. And they started giving him ones. He went from having a five out of five rating, the Firkin, which he was very proud of. He had good service, good food, nice ambiance. Uh, and, and they were they were going after him. They were going for the juggler. They were out to get take down his business. And that to me, folks, like that's just not, that's not, you know, we can agree or disagree on where bike lanes should go, but you don't take it to that level. Okay. You want to throw an egg at my house, I'll get the hose out, I'll clean it up. Okay. But don't go attacking small business owners who are trying to make a living. Anybody out there who knows anything about the restaurant business, it's hard enough to make a living with the restaurant business. Don't be out there going to those, stooping to those levels. There was a lady in Summerhill who posted uh, opposition to the bike lanes a, a year and a half ago before I was involved. They actually took her phone number and they tracked down, they said, I don't know how they did it, but there's ways you can find stuff. They found her phone number and her home address and her personal email address and her children's email addresses. And they, it's called doxing. And they basically started to put it up everywhere and telling people, if you don't support, uh, this lady doesn't support us, send her a message. And they started to publicly put her name out there everywhere. So and she started, like, she was worried for her personal safety. So, uh, you know, at the end of the day, people are afraid to be victimized by a very radical element to the cycling movement, which I don't rep think represents all cyclists. And so from the standpoint of why there isn't more organized opposition. Well, first of all, there isn't the infrastructure of money out there. Keep Toronto Moving is a volunteer organization. We don't have a half a million dollar a year budget with half a dozen full-time experienced employees like Cycle TO. We don't have the City of Toronto transportation budget. I mean, God, go to their website. They have people who are just in charge, communica experienced communications people who spent their careers communicating just in charge of promoting bike lanes and promoting infrastructure building on the bike lanes. Like it's a David and Goliath type of a comparison here. And so at the end of the day, what the cycling radicals want to position Keep Toronto as is an anti-bike organization and nothing could be further from the truth. We have no issues with cycling. We have many members of our group that are cyclists. We just believe that they need to be in the right, put bike lanes in the right places on the right streets that are safe for everybody, including cyclists. The reason so many cyclists are against these bike lanes that I've heard is that they don't think they're safe. And you've got these unlicensed bicycle couriers whipping up and down these bike lanes. A lot of cyclists don't feel safe traveling on those bike lanes. Uh, and so there's, there's so many more facets as senior citizens. My mother has macular degeneration. Okay, she goes every six to eight weeks to Toronto Western and gets a needle in her eyes to keep her, she's 80, 80 I won't see her exact age out of respect to my mom. <laughs> Doesn't look her age at all, by the way. Uh, I my guess mother it goes, runs in the family. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but anyway, mom, how's mom supposed to go out and walk around and, you know, he's hard enough, you know, just with the uh, regular traffic. Now you've got bike lanes, people who are elderly can't get out of their cars if they're being dropped off to a favorite merchant or a restaurant because there's now big concrete barriers that they can't get over. You know, there's so many facets to what's happening that is inconsiderate. What if you're disabled? Okay, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and being able to get around the city on darts, vehicles and that, there's so many facets to the people that this is impacting that are elderly, that are disabled. What about young mothers who have two or three kids? Like they've got to, and, and they, what are they going to cycle their children around the city to a hockey, can't practice, like, you know, groceries. Not everybody has the, the, the luxury, uh, you know, of taking their bicycle to their, to their grocery store and coming back. So it's, it's, a, it's been a very poorly 
thought out. It's being controlled by, I think, a radical element who've got control of City Hall, and we've got very weak councillors that are afraid of them. And that's not who they should be afraid of. What these councillors are going to realize is that what they've done and what they've voted in favor of repeatedly across the city is dead against what, how the public feel. And that's why I think on October 26th of 2026, we're going to see a story, you mark my words, where people are going to see it happen in Vancouver. Look at, we'll see what happened in Vancouver with the mayor there when they started handing out drug paraphernalia, drugs freely in the city. The citizens said enough. And they cleaned out the mayor's office and they cleaned out council. And they got a whole new group in there. And that's what's happened here. We've got a lot of dry rot at City Hall. People who've been in a city and council for too long, people are more concerned about getting, about having the bike lobby group oppose them than they are about representing actually what their constituents think. And so we've got work to do. And it's organizations, it's uh, individuals, small business owners like yourselves that are standing up, I think, and uh, it's just a matter of time before this is unwound. It will happen. And are there any city councillors that you would say have been allies or have been open to having real dialogue with you about what's going on? Absolutely. Out in Etobicoke, Stephen Holliday, he's led the charge out in the West End with Gordon Perks and, and Amber Morley opposing what everybody feels out there. He's he supports his constituency. They're not in favor of it. Stephen Holliday's in support of it. Uh, Jay Robinson, uh, she's a councillor up in the, uh, up in east, the northeast area of the city. I can't see exactly where. I'm not. A, I'm not. A, I don't follow municipal politics in terms of who they are. But there are people out there. There's a few others uh, as well, which I can't off the top of my head mention right now. But sure. there are about four or five of them. Mm -hmm. um, sadly, you know, I think we could have had stronger leadership from John Tory. I think a lot of us who voted for John Tory thought that he was a responsible voice that was going to keep the radical element of City Hall under control. Sadly, John didn't do what he said he was going to do, and none of us realized it until it was too late. So now we, we'll have a window uh, to, 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 to rectify it. By the way, I sat down with John Tory when he was still mayor about the Yonge Street bike lanes. And John said to a group of us, he said, nothing's final. Nothing's ever permanent. Because people were all worried, well, these bike lanes are going to be made permanent in March or April with the city. He said, nothing's ever permanent. You know, it's another vote can happen and they can, and things can be reversed. His mayorship wasn't permanent either, I guess. Well, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, at the end of the day, look, I think John Tory's a nice man. Uh, you know, I don't know him well. I don't know him personally really at all. But I, I you know, I think he's a nice person. I think he's honest. But I, I don't think he did a good job of representing people in his capacity as mayor. And I think in, with the hindsight of where we're at today with some of the problems the city has, he has to take some, account, has to take some accountability for that. Um, now, to be fair to him, council makes these decisions and, and, and he's only one vote at council. So John had 20 people sitting in a council room that if he, you know, if he, if he felt one way and they felt the other, it probably would have, he would have lost those council votes anyway. But I would have rather have lost with dignity and and feel that I lost on principle than uh, otherwise, and so he look at that's a that's across the bear that he'll he'll have to um, himself answer when people talk to him about things. But rather than look back, I'd rather look forward. And looking forward, I think there's an opportunity here uh, to clean up these mistakes. Just because there's a 400 pound concrete barrier being put up doesn't mean that we can't get that concrete barrier. And all those markings and all those, what are they called, lanterns or whatever, pulled right out again. The cost of keeping there is too great. It's whatever we, whatever good money we've lost in building out that infrastructure is lost money, unfortunately. But the cost of keeping them there would be worse. So after the next provincial election, we need to step back and we need to decide how we're going to deal with these bike lanes. I proposed during the mayoral by-election that we need to appoint a traffic czar. Okay, and that traffic czar... I like that not, idea. Uh, we need a traffic czar because the traffic is becoming insane in Toronto. I don't think there is anybody, uh, pedestrian, bicyclist, car driver... Uh, e-biker, courier. E-biker, courier. Like, I think everybody would agree that that is becoming a major, major, major issue and will eventually start to uh, lead to decay in the growth of our city if it isn't something that's addressed and fixed. And I think having somebody who is there to adjudicate 
over all of this with one specific mandate, maybe keep Toronto moving, I think would Mayor be- Mayor Fox? Mayor Fox, maybe? Possible. I was thinking, I was thinking vote May, for- Ma- Mayor Marin? I don't know. Oh, gosh, I, no. I, think, <laughs> I have a question, though. I have a question about this, because I think we can all agree that there has to be some middle ground a safe way for cyclists to move around the city, a safe way for cars to actually move from the west to the east and the south to the north, for businesses to be represented, for people to feel safe in their cars, on their bikes, on their e-bikes, and all the different devices that we all have, including public transit. Do you think there's an example of a city that has a climate like Toronto's that is doing it right? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I, I, I don't have that information. Yeah. I mean, I, um, I can't think just of one. one guy here running this volunteer organization. I'm sure there are cities out there doing a better job than we're doing for sure. And maybe that's a, that's a good area to do some research on. It's a great question. I, uh, I do think if we put a traffic czar in, it's not just bike lanes, it's construction. Why am I driving up and down University Avenue and I never see anyone working, but I see <laughs> yes. half the lanes blocked off? <laughs> like, sorry. <laughs> Why am I passing construction sites where there's never anyone working? (laughs) If you want to carve up part of an arterial road in this city for construction purposes, I want to see people working 24-7, okay? You have people working at night, okay? You, 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 these, 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 um, uh, contractors that are building these multi-million dollar condo towers need to also be accountable, right? But look, at these, you need to be accountable uh, to the public. And so from the standpoint of, uh, uh, you know, where we're at with the congestion, it's part of its bicycles. Part of it's the way the city is managing construction. Part of it is we don't have enough, I think, people out there ticketing cars that are uh, blocking major arterial roads, delivery trucks. Like there has to be some balance there. You know? And the delivery trucks will tell you, well, it's, you know, there's no longer anywhere to park. If I've got, if I've got, Items that need to be supplies that need to be de- delivered to a pub, like big uh, what are they called, Ralph? Uh, the big uh, beer um, beer cakes, right? Cakes, yeah. Uh, if I've got beer cakes, uh, you know, to be delivered, like uh, how am I supposed to get them in and out of my restaurants and that? So, like, there's there's got to be some utility to the way we look at how we use our public spaces, and so a traffic czar would not be responsible to the transportation department because they've shown that they're that that's a flawed place they would not be responsible to anybody but the mayor they would answer to the mayor and there would be no embedded conflicts of interest i love okay. it so I love that's it. one solution I love, I love it i think a huge fundamental problem in the city and this is what we're talking about is just a symptom of it is we really drop the ball with public transit. Like there was a time growing up in Toronto where I remember uh, people were coming from all over the world to see our transit system as it was an example of best in class. And we stopped investing for, for decades. And then we just talked about doing things and didn't do anything. And now when we actually get to the point where we can do something, like if you look at the Eglinton disaster with no budget and no timelines anymore, just there's no budget and it's just going to get built when it gets built. It's never going to end. Everybody like, you can imagine running a company like that or, or, or reporting to shareholders like that. And so I think that this is just systemic of a much larger failure over decades of our city trying to find Band-Aid solutions to deal with problems that should have been done with properly generations ago. And I think that that is still reverberating right now and has definitely been an element that led, has led us to where we're at with this problem. Well said. I couldn't agree with you more. And, and, and you know, so part of me too is an immigration. You know, we have a lot of immigrants, which are a good thing, coming into our country yeah. to fill jobs that need to be filled. And, and so uh, good for good for them uh, to be coming into Canada and good for Canada because we need, we, we, we have a shortage of labor and we need to bring people in to backfill that. But the problem is that we are ill-equipped as a city to manage that. And the federal government has downloaded uh, that to the municipalities and to the provincial government. And there's only one taxpayer, okay? There isn't a federal taxpayer and a separate provincial taxpayer, and a separate municipal taxpayer, there's one taxpayer. It's everybody watching this show and the, and the, and the three of us. And so there's only so much tax money out there to be, 
to be looking after infrastructure. And so part of it is that we're getting the immigration part right. Uh, we got to bring people in, but we have we don't we haven't properly planned you know to accommodate. Then lo- most of them are coming to Toronto. A good half a million, I think I heard, are coming to Toronto. And we j- Trevor, we there is there the is not properly planned. There is no plan. Yeah. There is no plan. And the other issue is a lot of these people coming into our city can't afford housing. And, and part of it is interest rates. You know, the, the elephant in the room is that we have unprecedented high interest rates. And hopefully in the next year and a half, two years, they'll start to come back down again. But there's, a, there's no way for people to be in a position where they can afford to buy homes, even if those homes existed, which they don't. And so that's driving up the rental market. And then that's not good for people either who are barely making enough money, if at all, to be able to rent a place. So then if they can't rent, then they need to figure out where they can live to still be able to commute around. So it's, a, it's complex. And, there's, and I'm not saying I have all the answers. I know I don't. But what I do know is that putting bike lanes on the major arterial roads <laughs> of the city, the busiest roads, is the wrong place. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist. I'm certainly not one. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that we need to do a major rethink here, but we need to do it objectively with proper data and data that's been objectively gathered, not gathered with a, with a pre, predetermined conclusion in place already. The city's going to be doing a public consultation. They're doing it in the next, I think, in early December. And I looked at the consultation online. They have a, they have a questionnaire. They're paying $50 for bicycle couriers. They're motivating bicycle couriers to come and speak at their public consultation. They're giving $50 for 30 people to show up at their consultation. Wow. If you're a bicycle courier. Uh, so they're actually paying people who they feel will be in their corner to come to the public consultation and speak to what they think about bike lanes. Like, Brian, do I live in this country? This is, it's all on the website. Anyways, lots to talk about with this issue. Happy to come back. You are going to be inundated with people on this podcast because I've done a bunch of these things and the reports I get back on unprecedented numbers. I encourage anyone watching this webcast, please forward it to your 25 favorite friends and family members because this is, an, this is a grassroots um, message out there. There, you will get nothing in the mail. You will see nothing through the city of Toronto. You need to, as an individual, be empowered to share this message with your own network. And that's democracy at its best. And, you know, people just click after this podcast and go back and watch uh, another Netflix movie or do whatever. And this is a time poorly spent. But if people, we can encourage people to get out there and take this podcast and Get it out there to your friends and family members and neighbors and work colleagues. That's how we're going to make change on this issue. That's the only way we're going to make change on this issue because people need to know there's a place to go. Keep torontomoving.ca, sign up, get, get yourself signed up to our organization, and we will start to communicate with you. And you'll be on the inside of what's going to be a very effective campaign to make change when we get to the next election under three years away. I love it. Special thank you to Trevor from Keep Toronto Moving. I'll be sure to link up your website and all those key details in the show notes below. So all your information will be there. Easy for our viewership and our listeners to gather that information. Thank you, audience, so much for tuning in today's Toronto Real Estate Podcast. If you enjoyed our journey through the city's cycling strategies, remember to subscribe, drop your comments, and I know you're going to have lots of comments about this. I will be prepared (laughs) with your thoughts and turn on those notifications to stay updated on everything that affects this city that we all call home. Your insights make our discussions richer and better. Please contact us. We're super nice. Ralph, How would you like to take us home? Trevor, thank you so much for joining us today. That was really, really fun and insightful. And I just want to reiterate to anybody who's watched this and actually made it to the end, thank you so much for for watching and sharing with us today. We'd absolutely love to hear any comments that you have, especially if they're of the constructive nature. And please remember, always, always, always to smash that like and subscribe button. Thank you for the opportunity, guys. It was a pleasure chatting with you. And uh, I look forward to uh, talking to you guys again. Absolute pleasure. Thanks, Trevor. Thank you, Trevor.